the limitless sky. I am the inspiration that led success so high. I will achieve. Nation's trusted bank, SBI, the banker to every Indian. Hello and welcome to The Banking Show, where we bring to you the stories behind major developments in the banking space. I am Ruchika Chitravanshi and in today's show, we will talk about the first of its kind town hall at the RBI with the bank boards. In Banker's View, we have Gigi Maman, Executive Director and CEO of Sadhan, the self-regulatory body for MFIs. Banking for you today is all about unclaimed deposits and what happens to them. Later in the show, Tamal Bandhupadhyay, our consulting editor, will join us to talk about RBI's response in the COVID years and the way forward. At the end of the show, we will share the results of last week's poll and the question for this week. Reserve Bank Governor Shakti Kanta Das will meet the boards of both state-run and private sector banks next week. The topic of discussion? Issues related to governance and ethics. This is the first time RBI will be holding such a meeting. Raghu Mohan gives us the lowdown on the agenda and why RBI is holding this town hall meeting. In a first-of-its-kind initiative, the Reserve Bank of India, or RBI, has called a meeting of state-run and private bank boards on May 22nd and 29th. The twin meetings will primarily discuss issues related to governance, ethics, the role of the boards, and supervisory expectations. RBI Governor Shakti Kanta Das, Deputy Governors, and the Executive Directors of the Central Bank's Department of Supervision, Department of Regulation, and Enforcement Department will participate in the interaction. It's very uh, relevant in the current context, uh, given what is happening globally, especially with the SVB Bank. Uh, RBA's meeting is very important to drive home that governance is the most critical aspect in running a bank. Uh, if you recall, Raghu, uh, the emphasis on, on the whole rating uh, uh, system and model which they had was on several financial parameters, including governance. But I increasingly see a, a increased weightage on the governance aspects coming in. Given that uh, number of instances we have seen in the recent past in the Indian context too, where the, come on the governance standards of the financial institution were come to a questionable uh, area, I think it's critical for RBI to address the boards directly and emphasize on the, their role in the whole governance uh, aspect. In her union budget speech, Finance Minister Nirmala Sitharaman expressed the need for better governance and investor protection in banking. The RBI's meetings are seen as a step in that direction. The FM had proposed certain amendments to the RBI Act 1934, the Banking Regulation Act 1949, and the Banking Companies Acquisition and Transfer of Undertakings Act 1970. Key issues put forward in RBI's discussion paper on governance in commercial banks in India, released on June 11, 2020, are expected to figure in the deliberations. This paper's objective was to align the current regulatory framework with global best practices while being mindful of the context of the domestic financial system. It was also for empowering bank boards to set the culture and values of the organization recognize and manage conflicts of interest, set the appetite for risk and manage risks within the appetite, improve the supervisory oversight of senior management, strengthen the assurance functions through various interventions, achieve clear division of responsibilities between the board and the management, and to encourage the separation of ownership from management. On November 16, 2021, Governor Das spoke of the RBI's high expectations from the oversight role of bank boards, that they ensure business models and strategies are conscious choices, following a robust strategic discussion in the board, instead of being driven by mechanical follow-the-market approach. He pointed out that certain banks had followed the high-risk and high-return business strategy, with a skewed priority for serving only the interest of their investors. 
the active role of the board especially in challenging the proposals of the management thus becomes critical playing in the background are the new risks to global banking flowing from the dramatic collapse of the silicon valley bank in an increasingly interconnected world in his forward to the december 2022 financial stability report das referred to the cumulative impact of the extraordinary shocks to the world over the last 3 years which is still working its way through across countries that the international economic order stands challenged financial markets are in turmoil due to monetary tightening in most parts of the world food and energy supplies and prices are under strain debt distress is staring at many emerging markets and developing economies and every economy is grappling with multiple challenges there are no doubt newer challenges to global banking and rbi's proactive role in ensuring good governance in banks whether private or state run is quite timely in our bankers view segment today raghu mohan speaks to gigi mamen executive director and ceo of sadhan the self regulatory body for microfinance institutions about how the sector has put the pains of the pandemic behind itself here's the conversation hello gigi mohan thanks for being on the bs backing show really appreciate it why has stress in the 90 day past two bucket gone up for microfinance institutions see you know that uh, microfinance went through a very tough time during the covid and uh, in the last two years from 2021 2020 to 2021 it uh, suffered a huge loss because of the covid impact so during that period there had been some uh, nba built up which continues mm. but if you see the current uh, loans especially the loans which have been disbursed after say 21 uh, september or so that is after the second wave was over the recovery is almost near normal it is 98% 99% some people talk about even more than that so the nba which you are seeing the, especially the the nba beyond the, 180 days or 90 days 90 days of course i don't think much would be there because the overall net npa at the moment is less than 2% so whatever you are seeing is above 180 days and 180 days is mainly because of the covid impact what is the corpus that we are talking about in terms of npas see it's uh, around the 13% of the total that was the last quarter uh, result was showing that is a third quarter no numbers are showing that almost 13% of the total outstanding was above 180 days which works out to something like 40 plus 1000 group uh, crores but then uh, as i said you know this is mainly because of the nba built up during the covid period number one number two is that see it also it also depends on the uh, on the right of policy of the institutions some of the institution especially the the bigger en- entities they were able to write up the uh, the npas and clean up their balance sheet so which is not figuring here whereas uh, some of the smaller ones and the banks especially you know banks has got around 56% mm. of, uh, uh, 56% of the portfolio share in the portfolio so in banks generally the the right of policy is totally different than the mfi so it, it got built up so mainly it is because of the npa because of the banks portfolio which is not written off and also because of uh, uh, the smaller mfi who could not write of the nbs can it be safely assumed that the pande- pandemic induced stress is behind us definitely in fact uh, see uh, leaving about that whatever is happened during that period which is a legacy which may continue for some more time uh, means i am saying that uh, the 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 current loans are all on the almost at the normal level of recovery which is so you can very well say that uh, that uh, pandemic uh, impacts have, have been uh, totally reduced there's gone please the higher rejection rates in the industry yes in fact uh, you know that uh, new, when the new regulatory norms came uh, they have uh, stipulated certain kind of criteria for being a microfinance loan one is that a 3 lakh uh, household income annual in household income number two is that the overall uh, recover uh, repayment obligation of a uh, household should not exceed more than 50% of the monthly uh, monthly income so these are the two areas which uh, uh, definitely uh, causing a in the sense uh, it is coming in the way of uh, rejections because 
uh, some cases there are uh, the households their incomes have gone beyond the three lakh level which is good so the only thing is that it can't be counted as a microfinance loans secondly is that see when you take the indebtedness of a household all the loans of a household husband may be having some loan the sons children may be having some loan if you take all these things and when the uh, repayment obligation is computed it goes beyond 50% so these are two areas and of course default case are also there especially those who have, those in, uh, members who have defaulted during the covid period their history still con uh, continues to be as a defaulter so that also comes in the way a case has been made that p2p lenders should be allowed into secured finance how will this play on the mfi industry see uh, my my take is that india is such a large country we have sufficient space for everyone even now if you see the microfinance sector you just see that around 82% of the portfolio it is from 10 10 states 56% of the portfolio is from five states 25% sorry 25 20% of the portfolio is contributed by 25 districts so there is a lot of skewed development as far as the sector is concerned so which means that there is a huge space for lending to take place i was just seeing the numbers of the districts around 100 top 100 uh, districts contribute around 47% of the portfolio top 200 districts contribute about 70% of the portfolio that means around 300 for uh, around 300 uh, if you take almost the uh, uh, entire portfolio would be contributed by around 300 um, uh, districts which means uh, quite a large number of districts are still not fully covered uncovered or fully covered or very very minimal, minimal covered so there is a huge space and even if you see the uh, the potential say, of microfinance worked out, the current level of uh, microfinance portfolio is somewhere around 3.5 lakh crores. I mean, that is a that is a optimistic uh, estimation which we are having for the current year because it, was, it touched 3.4 lakh crores in February. So it should be 3.5 lakh crores by the end of uh, March. We are still not having the final figures. Uh, whereas the, the, the estimated uh, potential for this uh, sector is as high as 24 lakh crores. So I'm saying is there is a huge potential available where quite a large number of players can come in. And uh, I don't I don't think uh, P2P lenders will cause any kind of a uh, discomfort for the MFI lending. And moreover, P2P lending, as you said, it's on a security based lending. Whereas here we are talking about the poor people who do not have uh, any securities to offer. So there are a large number of people who would be Definitely, we're looking for taking from loans from the MFIs. Is there a case for MFIs to get a line of refinance given the yes. cost of funds issue? See, uh, refinance is already available from a couple of institutions, as you know. NABAD provides refinance, uh, SIDB provides refinance, and Mudra re provides refinance to uh, the microfinance institutions. But that is not sufficient, mainly because, see, the uh, the the kind of uh, the volume of lending taking place as I, as I said you know now the, already we are touching around 3.5 lakh crores that means uh, around uh, uh, 2 to 3 lakh crore must have been dispersed during this year so whereas the 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 disbursement from the refinancing institution would be very a fraction of that so there is a huge need for a funding mechanism as far as uh, uh, mfis are concerned Gigi Mawan, thanks for being on the back, DS Backing Show. We would like to have, have you again. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. An important point by Gigi Mammon is that the microfinance sector could do with cheaper funding options to ease the burden on customers at the bottom of the pyramid. Over a week ago, Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman asked regulators to conduct a special drive to facilitate the settlement of unclaimed deposits and claims in the financial sectors across segments such as banking deposits, shares, dividends, mutual funds, insurance, etc. In our next segment, Raghu Mohan explains all about unclaimed deposits. The Reserve Bank of India will launch a 100 days, 100 pays campaign for banks from June 1st to trace and settle the top 100 unclaimed deposits in every district of the country within 100 days. But what are unclaimed deposits? These are the balances in saving or current accounts that have not been operated for a decade. 
or fixed deposit accounts that have not been operated for a decade since maturity. Such deposits are classified as unclaimed deposits. At the end of Feb 2023, the total amount of unclaimed deposits transferred to RBI by public sector banks for deposits not operated for a decade or more was 35,012 crore rupees. What happens to unclaimed deposits? Unclaimed deposits are transferred by banks to the Depositor Education and Awareness or DEA fund maintained by the RBI. RBI runs awareness campaigns to encourage the public to identify and approach the banks for claiming such deposits. Recently, the RBI also announced the setting up of a centralized web portal for the public to search unclaimed deposits across multiple banks. The To Be Launched Soon 100 Days 100 Pays campaign will complement the ongoing efforts and initiatives by the banking regulator to reduce the quantum of unclaimed deposits and return them to their rightful owners and claimants. What about the interest on such deposits? According to the RBI, the deposits transferred to the RBI DEA fund earn an interest of 4% per annum for deposits transferred till June 30, 2018, 3.5% for those transferred between July 1, 2018 and May 10, 2021, and 3% effective May 11, 2021 till the time of payment to the depositor or claimant. Banks review accounts annually and identify those that may not have seen any operation over a year. They may approach customers and inform them in writing and ascertain the reasons for the same. They have also been advised to consider launching a special drive for finding the customer's whereabouts and legal hires regarding accounts which have become inoperative where there have been no transactions in an account for over two years. Further, banks are required to display the list of unclaimed deposits and inoperative accounts for a decade or more on their respective websites with the list containing the names and addresses of the account holders. The RBI has advised banks to proactively find the whereabouts of account holders whose accounts have remained inoperative. I am the blue of the limitless sky. I am the inspiration that lets success so high. I will achieve. Nation's trusted bank, SBI, the banker to every Indian. So if you have any unclaimed deposits, banks may soon reach out to you. And hopefully now, with FM's push, you can claim them hassle-free. It has been three years since the COVID pandemic upended regular activity worldwide. On May 5th, the WHO officially announced that the pandemic had ended. I spoke with Amal Bandhupadhyay, our consulting editor, on RBI's handling of the pandemic and what it did or did not do well. Hi, Tamal. Welcome to The Banking Show again. Uh, WHO has announced the end of a global health emergency and perhaps it is obviously a very good time to look at how RBI tackled uh, the borrowings during these pandemic years. Can you take us through what... Uh, is it that the RBI did and also set the context for us in comparison to what did the U.S. Uh, Federal Reserve do? Thanks, Rujika. Yes, of course, the provocation for writing this column is uh, WHO announcement that uh, COVID, COVID pandemic is history now. Apart from the fact also, it just, you know, coincided uh, with, the, with the phenomenon of uh, 10 year paper bond yield dropping below 7%, um, the market's comfort. Uh, so that's that's why I thought let's take a look, take a look closely at what happened during this period, and how Reserve Bank of India, the government market banker, has definitely managed the borrowing program. Now look at the borrowing program. You know, in 2020, 
the borrowing program was 7.1 trillion fiscal year 2020 i'm talking about now once we got into uh, pandemic year a 2021 fiscal year borrowing was 13.7 trillion next year 2022 it dropped to 11.3 trillion but very next year, 2023, it rose again to 14 trillion plus, 14.2 trillion. And as we speak, this year, it's yet another historic high, 15.4 trillion borrowing program. So if you combine this last four years borrowing program, it's, the, it's more than the outstanding borrowing program, total borrowing, government outstanding bonds in some, uh, 2017 or 2018. So, but where is the yield? As we speak, it's, it's less than 7%. So who got the benefit of the debt handling is, is the government of India. But despite that such a huge borrowing program, Reserve Bank of India managed it so well. And uh, remember, RBI has not done any OMO, the so-called open market operations through which uh, RBI actually buy government bonds. It has not done so. So it's an extremely... Uh, I would say efficient way of managing the government's huge borrowing. Yes, government is the greatest beneficiary of this, but at the same time, corporate India also got benefit because as you know, the corporate bonds are also, the yield is linked to the government bond. And the, if the spread sinks, which it has done, so which means the best rated corporates also got, get the benefit. So RBI has done pretty well during this time to fight inflation because uh, you know this COVID, the, the flood of liquidity and the ultra loose monetary policy. Um, monetary policy came down to its historic low at four percent. Now RBI has to hike it, and some four percent as we speak, it has gone up to six point five percent. So that's 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 what Reserve Bank of India has done, but it has not <laughs> overdone. It has not overdone. It's a pretty deft balancing act that has not done. It's good for the economy and good for the banking system. In contrast to, as you asked me, what's happening in the US? The US, you will find that the rate hike has been much more sharper. As you see, US started hiking the rate before RBI. RBI did it in May 2020. US started before that. In fact, just RBI hiked it just before the second US rate hike, which was 50 basis point. Uh, before that, uh, that's that's how RBI did. So US had to be a much sharper, had to go for a much sharper rate hike because the US inflation is also much more entrenched and higher and it's a 44 decade high. Now, what is it that you would have had RBI do differently? Do you have any criticism as well of what the RBI did? Well, no, yeah, it may sound like all, it may sound like all praise for the RBI. No, I, I do think that RBI could have acted a little faster. I think the first rate hike from 4 to 4.40, which is an off-cycle rate hike just before US Federal Reserve's second hike, I'm talking about uh, uh, May, 2000, uh, May last year, it could have been earlier, you know, because uh, RBI misread the inflation uh, numbers. If you uh, if you look at, if you take a look at the Bank of India's February monetary policy last year, you know, it was, it was pretty bullish uh, on inflation front, on interest rate front. So the criticism, one criticism reserve I have is this, probably RBI should have started the rate hiking cycle earlier than what it has done. We are about uh, less than a month away from the next uh, monetary policy. Uh, what is the way going forward? Well, uh, if you look at uh, the last policy, where is the Bank of India's, it was a hawkish pause. And RBI governor said that don't take comfort, don't see that. Even though it was a decision, consistent decision for the for the status quo, but RBI governor repeatedly warned in his post-policy statement that uh, we are not a true... It all depends on the data that is come for, uh, that would be the incoming data. We'll take a look at it. So it was, a, uh, I would say, it was a pretty hawkish uh, status quo, hawkish pause. But as we have seen the April number, I'm pretty convinced that uh, the June policy again will be status quo. Uh, so for all you know, probably we have seen the, uh, we have seen the, 
uh, end of the rate hiking cycle, probably the 6.5% current rate is the rate um, which RBI would hold on before actually cutting the rate. So, unless, uh, unless there's some dramatic development uh, on the external front. On, ex on the internal front, as I said, uh, as far as Indian economy is concerned, uh, one good good story is this inflation is has come back and it's within the RBI uh, comfort zone, the RBI target uh, band, and it will continue to show because of the high base effect. And secondly, on the rupee front also, we have nothing much to be worried about. Thank you so much, uh, Tamal, for those uh, indications and for all the insights. After three years of pandemic, it is good to know that uh, inflation is in the comfort zone and we don't have to worry on the currency side also that much uh, right now. Uh, thanks again, Tamal. We'll see you next week. I think Tamal agrees that the RBI has done fairly well to support the economy and protect the banking system in the COVID years. Moving on to our last and final segment, the BS poll. In the last episode, we asked you, will the RBI follow in the footsteps of the US Fed? 49% of our respondents said yes, and 51% of our respondents said no. Earlier in the show today, we had talked about RBI's town hall with bank boards and its trigger. The risks to global banking flowing from the dramatic collapse of the Silicon Valley Bank, along with several other global challenges, have made global markets and the banking sector sit up and take notice. So we are asking you this week, are Indian banks safe? Tell us what you think on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, Telegram and our website. Our poll is open from Thursday, which is today itself. And we will be back next week with more news and analysis. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn. I am the blue of the limitless sky. I am the inspiration that lets success so high. I will achieve. Trusted Bank, SBI, the banker to every Indian.